Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Charles Moyo. Welcome once more to our Wednesday uh, City African um, virtual presentations. Uh, today, I'm going to present uh, two short cases of uh, complicated uh, master diabetes that we managed here at Hoskia Hospital. And then I will further on I discuss two sections of uh, complications of mastoid diabetes, that is one, and neck abscesses and uh, lateral sinus thrombosis. Uh, just as a reminder, if you've got any questions, uh, you can use the, the raise hand function at the end of the presentation, or you can type a question on the, on the chat function. And uh, as a reminder, again, please keep your, mic your microphones muted and uh, your, your, your videos are also um, but okay. So without further ado, um, I'll go on to my talk. <clears throat> so I have obtained consent for the use of this, uh, two patients' uh, clinical information. I didn't, I didn't include any patients' images, but however, I included uh, images for the uh, uh, radiological investigations. I had no intention for copyright infringement, and I included my references at the end. So my first patient is Mr. T, he's 46 years of age, uh, who, who presented uh, with right ear discharge and a painful neck swelling uh, of unknown duration. He was coming from um, a, a home-based uh, care facility. And of note, it was, it was that it, this was the third episode of ear discharge in the past year. And on background history, HIV, he was HIV negative, uh, he, he was intellectually disabled. He had a dense cataract. Uh, he was blind for also an unknown duration. So, <clears throat> on uh, from the referring from the referral letter, I also had a, a dendectomy about two weeks prior presentation, and uh, I only received a prophylactic dose of IV of mental. So, on examination, uh, I think because of his intellectual uh, status, he was quite combative. He could hear, but he wasn't able to, to, to speak. He didn't have any stripe, and uh, those were the vitals. The temperature was 37.8, the low grade fever, a detachy uh, cardio 120, blood pressure was normal, as well as respiratory rate and, and uh, HGT. And on your examination, uh, as, as noted that he was not a very cooperative uh, patient. Uh, they of note, he had a right and discharge with a minimum mustard swelling uh, on the right side uh, with intact facial nerve. Uh, he was alert, uh, though difficult to assess the level of consciousness. They had no many, many disease and oral cavity examination had no oral sepsis. And on throat examination, had no evidence of any tonsillitis or pharyngitis, and no mineralization of the tonsils, and nose examination was normal. And on neck examination, had a large, a firm right neck swelling extending from level one to four of the neck, with the minimal pass uh, aspirated initially with the 16 gauge uh, anatom. This way is blood investigations. He had a raised white cell count of 22. He had a, a mild anemia of 12.1. MCV was normal as well as the thrombocytosis of 651. There's a, also at the rate CRP of 342. UND and creatinine were normal. His COVID test was negative on admission. Um, so basically this shows the axial view on view of, of, of the CT scan. So yet uh, this soft tissue uh, uh, sort of lesion which has evolved in the middle ear and the mastoid with the bony erosion on the external auditory canal wall and there was significant soft tissue swelling with a, a, a small uh, subperior stealth collection over the, uh, over the mastoid. And again on soft tissue you can appreciate uh, this, uh, this, uh, the significant soft tissue swelling and the small uh, subperiostal uh, uh, collection. And then on coronal view, this basically to demonstrate the neck abscess. Uh, you can see this sort of like a, a rim enhancing uh, collection, which is extending from the right uh, uh, temporal bone, sort of mastoid region, down to the up to the level of the of the of the of the, of the, of the, of the so notice that this was a, a continuous. Um, 
uh, collection, which has, of course, most, the most likely source being the, 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 the master aid. And again, this is just a such a view to demonstrate this uh, net collection, which was extending to, from the base of scarf, basically from the master aid uh, up to the, up to the uh, uh, job, job clarity. So the working diagnosis was a complicated uh, master diagnosis with a, 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 a basal abscess. And then the patient was subsequently taken to theater for a way a right critical mass detection was performed. And there was finding of um, a, a, a small subperiostal abscess and a large polyp in the external outlet canal, obscuring the view of the tympanic membrane. And there was also a defect in the, in the posterior wall of the, of the external outlet canal into the mastery. Uh, with passing the mastery antrium, there was, uh, there was an oscar mastery. The, there was, oh, the master it was also sclerotic and uh, uh, noted the neck collection which was extending from the skin, uh, anterior to the skin master from the of skull to the, to the level of the gap. So, uh, critical master detection was done and the neck access was also uh, drained via a transvital incision. So, if we look at the differential diagnosis of uh, in, in, uh, here for you basically, you can uh, think along these lines, it can either, either be inflammatory, which is the most common cause of ear polyps, or you can get a foreign bodies or neoplasms, be it benign or malignant. Look at infections, you may have non specific infections like bacterial infections, fungal or protozoal infections, uh, tuberculosis in our African uh, context, which is, which is quite common, uh, of which to be the city findings or sort of like, or such as still. Or, or, Positivity to the more eaten bone appearance. A syphilis can also be, be, be considered as a potential of an air polyp. Cholesterol are also common in the maybe as uh, an oral polyp, and you also take note of uh, granulomatous conditions that may present as, as, as polyp. And then you have put a spectrum of, of neoplasms, be it a primary or, or, or secondary uh, polyps. So uh, in terms of management, the post operatively the patient was uh, managed with IV augmenting, uh, corrugated drains were removed after 48 hours. Uh, he was um, apparential for the duration of his post op stay. Um, and the analysis are waiting the uh, histopathology results and MCNS results. And the sepsis completely uh, resolved. And these were his results on gram stain. Uh, the, the, the results showed a numerous neutral uh, numerous gram positive cocci and gram negative bacilli. A tin aspect was negative for and the tin stain was negative for TB. And uh, we cultured a uh, proteus mirabilis, uh, which was sensitive to uh, most edges uh, that we commonly use, that is, ampicillin, moxicillin, bactrin, keftriaxin, uh, etc. And then this was the histology result, um, which uh, basically I will read through. So on, on microscopy, the, on, micros on macroscopy, it was only a single piece of, of tissue. This was taken from the neck and showed the scant fibrous fragments with mixed inflammation, comprising of plasma cells, lymphocytes, neutrophils, and histiocytes, and uh, was negative for any granulomas or malignancy. And also the tail stain and modified the tail stain was, was, was negative for, for acid fast uh, and alcohol fast bacillus. So this uh, in conclusion, the pathological diagnosis was compatible with an um, with the bacterial abscess. So the next question was uh, what next? So the uh, unfortunately on his uh, subsequent on his hospital stay, he subsequently tested uh, COVID positive. Well, it was awaiting a loop uh, operation where we planned in EUA uh, plus woman as a, a, a canal or down for subtotal petrosotomy in view of, of the patient's uh, a, a, a social conditions as well. That like he was not the patient you would want to, to be bringing back to the cleaning for cleaning of a master cap. It was going to be quite difficult because of his, of his intellectual inability. So, um, and then I'll go on to case number two. Case number two is Miss T, who is 29 years of age, who presented with um, a three-day stroke headache, neck pain, nausea, and vertigo. 
at a right on a, at a background on a background is to of right autoria with the right autoria and associated right here in those. Um, she had no previous TB treatment, no constitutional symptoms, no history of any trauma. Uh, of course, she was uh, uh, RBD positive on art. It, uh, she was virally suppressed at the latest city for count of 558. And then the, on examination, these were vitals, the temperature was 36.7, respiratory rate was 5, slightly borderline tachycardia, HDT was also normal. And serious examination at my next stiffness, uh, TCS was 15, um, powers normally no focalizing signs, it arise, a right sided case and a stagnus. And on e examination, it right at polyp with an underlying perforation plus otoria. It normally must be and it's so swelling, um, but it's significant here in those uh, with the possibility of a dead ear. As we weave our lateral into the to the left ear with the no response on the on the right yes. uh, Otherwise, the rest of the final examination was essentially normal. So in investigations, she had a normal white cell count, um, a, a mild anemia of ten point eight, and a MCV was was slightly low, sixty two, and a thrombocytosis of five hundred. Urea treatment and uh, electrolytes were normal. Uh, CSF uh, studies were also normal. So this is just a, an exit view um, of, of, of a CT scan, which sort of demonstrate uh, this slight feeling defect on the on the right on the right sigmoid sigmoid sinus. Of course, this is uh, the gold standard you've been an MRI venogram if you're trying to demonstrate a um, uh, signal uh, lateral sinus uh, thrombosis. But basically, this was our, 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 waking, our waking diagnosis. So in terms of management, she also uh, uh, was underwent a critical mastectomy with the finding of a pale granulation tissue in the mastoid, uh, which was perhaps it and same for histopathology, MCMS and TPMCMS. She was also commenced on uh, heptrixone in 30 uh, with analgesia and awaiting an outpatient protocol. So these were the results of the, of the biopsy. Um, so on uh, microscopy, uh, there were fragments of, of fibrosis tissue uh, demonstrating organizing fibrosis and non-specific lymphoplasmacity inflammation. There was no evidence of any granulomatous uh, inflammation, uh, tibia, or any malignancy. Certain stain was also negative for us, first bacilli. And on um, uh, uh, the, the, the conclusion was that it was an organizing granulation tissue, no evidence of any malignancy for, for TB. And then on MCNS, gram uh, stain didn't, didn't show any organisms. Uh, on John culture, there was no growth. And certain stain was negative on the tissue that was sent for microbiology. And she was planned for a, a, a relook and repeat a, a, a biopsy in, in, in view of, of the suspected um, uh, TB of the chamber board. So, with, in, with those cases, this brings us to our discussion of uh, complications of either act, of active chronic otitis media, be it a mucosa or squamous disease. So basically, these complications, you can classify them into either intracranial complications or extracranial complications. Uh, your intracranial complications being meningitis, brain abscesses, empyema, lateral sinus thrombosis, and otitic hydrocephalus. And then your extracranial complications, you can divide them into intra-temporal and extra-temporal complications. Your extra-temporal complications being your post, uh, post-auricular a, a superior child abscess or your, your neck abscesses that we'll discuss later. And uh, your intratemporal being your petrous apicitis, sufficient nerve palsy, and the labyrinthitis. And then if you look at the incidence, I got this table from Scott Brown. If you look at the incidence of extracranial versus intracranial uh, 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 complications, uh, extra in, in terms of extracranial complications, the most common thing in about 75% of cases being uh, the, the posterior abscess, uh, followed by facial nerve palsy. In 2% of cases, you get the basal abscess. 
in uh, Petra's uh, appendicitis as well as meningitis. If you look at the intracranial complications, um, brain abscess tells the least, uh, with sub uh, abscesses and uh, extratural abscesses as well as uh, lateral sinus thrombosis in that uh, particular weather. And then uh, if you look at uh, neck abscesses per se, the mastodromatic cell tracks occurs during a, an acute otitis media. They play a major role in terms of the pathogenesis of autogenic head and neck abscesses. And there is usually osteomyelitis of the underlying bone with the uh, erosion, uh, uh, making it the meters of uh, spread of infection uh, to, the, to, the, to the neck. Then if you look at the uh, temporal bone from the inferior surface, uh, in, in terms of uh, description of, 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 the, of the types of the neck um, abscesses. So usually a basal abscess originates from the tip of, of, of the mastoid and it can spread usually medially and uh, it, 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 there is usually erosion of the medial surface and the tip of the, of the mastoid. Uh, and this infection then spreads downwards on the, on the medial uh, surface of the sternal gate mastoid or along the, the posterior belly of, 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 of the diagnostic. And then if you try to compare this with the CTL, the CTL abscess is mostly a uh, posteriorly placed. It's, it's uh, posterior to the mastoid tip, but at times it may be difficult to, once it's pressed to the neck, it may be difficult to differentiate between uh, actually a CTL and a, 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 basal, a basal abscess. And then um, you also have a, a Lux abscess, uh, which is hypothesized to, to probably spread from the uh, external water canal or above the node of, or spread of infection above the node of weakness uh, into the zygomatic uh, cells, uh, 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 and then uh, developing into a, a sub or into an abscess uh, deep to, to the temporalis uh, uh, mass. That's the Lux. Uh, abscess. And there's also a moret described, what you call a, a moret mastoiditis triangle, which is basically a triangle in between the bony projection of the mastoid antrum and the, the diagnostic fossa. Uh, this is mostly leaders of, uh, of, of, of site of origin of infection that's usually expressed to the deep net space, that is the retropharyngeal and the parapharyngeal and the parapharyngeal space. So if we look at them, uh, the different neck, uh, uh, different abscesses, the most common is the, the retroauricular, the, the subcrestial abscess, which is actually quite more common in children. Uh, this is due to fact that the largest cell in children is the, is the, is the andral cell. And then uh, the commonest site is uh, the andral projection onto the lateral surface of, of, of the temporal bone where that is prone to erosion and developing of, development of a, a sub abscess. And then a, a basal abscess was initially described by uh, a, a F. Basalt in 1881. It basically runs down through the neck, uh, through the apex and middle hole of the mastoid process. And it uh, images, if you are trying to differentiate it from that CTL abscess, it usually images under the mastoid process, whereby the CTL abscess images posterior to the to the mastoid process. But once in the neck, it is difficult to uh, differentiate uh, it from uh, Citellis uh, abscess. So Citellis abscess initially described by Citellin, that is in 1901. It is uh, it, it usually what is posterior to the mastoid process. And then the hypothesis is that it's a, a spread of infection via the emisalic pain or via the occipital mastoid suture. And then it may spread in the neck in between the stenocleto mastoid uh, and the diagnostic, as well as a, a similar patient like the basal. So basically, the decision whether basal or CTL uh, abscess does, doesn't necessarily change the scope of surgical, surgical treatment, but uh, may direct the surgeon within um, the, the mastoid, just any important point to note. And then we're going to Luke's abscess. Uh, Lux abscess was uh, uh, first described by Luke in 1918, and the hypothesis is, is, uh, is that it is uh, due to spread of infection uh, above the notch of uh, revenous into the zygomatic cells, or spread of infection by the profound auricular artery or through the external auditory canal. Uh, 
uh, and which is, which basically leads to an extratemporal uh, and subperiodic collection, which is usually deep to the to the temporalis muscle. And then um, the, the other entity that was described is Moretz mastoiditis that uh, was described by Moretz in 1914, which he described as a, a survival diagnostic inflammation of the mastoid process. Uh, Moretz triangle is uh, described uh, uh, before, that's the root of spread to the, to the deep neck, and it is usually a small lump in between the diagnostic fossa and the bony base of, 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 of the mastoid and antrum. So basically, that's that about um, the types of uh, head and neck, uh, neck abscesses that you, uh, are autogenic. And now we'll go on to a lateral sinus uh, thrombosis. So lateral sinus thrombosis was considered a frequent complication of acute otitis media in the beginning of the last century uh, before the, the use of in the pre-antibiotic era. So histori historically, you know that um, a lateral sinus thrombosis had mortality rates up to 100%. And uh, recently, due to the widespread use of antibiotics, uh, the mortality rates have gone down to as low as less than 10%, especially in young adults, which is uh, uh, generally associated with the hypo hypercoagulable states, whether congenital or acquired, in up to uh, about 40% of cases. And then this is a basically a diagram to show you the relations of uh, the cerebral venous sinuses. So the uh, lateral sinus is basically formed when, from the confluence of the, or the sigmoid sinus is formed from the confluence of the superior uh, petrosal sinus and the transverse sinus, which forms the sigmoid sinus. The term lateral sinus uh, is inherited from the fact that uh, this sinus is encountered laterally on, uh, when you're doing a mastoid dectomy. But again, you should note that these dural venous sinuses, they are, they are valve valveless and it's infection can basically spread, spread either antigrade uh, into the distal uh, sinuses and, and, and veins or retrograde into the uh, confluence of sinuses, cavernous sinus and up into the superior, uh, into the superior sagittal sinus. So if we look at the pathophysiology of uh, lateral sinus thrombosis, so initially there is a infection spread to the perisinus with formation of a peri uh, a sinus uh, abscess. And this leads to thrombophilitis and, and mural uh, uh, thrombus. And all these processes, they lead to a, a local hypocoagulable uh, state uh, with, with reduced uh, blood flow, uh, making that region prone to more thrombus uh, uh, formation. So the obliteration of the intrasinus uh, lumen may then lead to a necrosis of, of the thrombus and formation of an intrasinus abscess, and then which can either uh, propagate a progress into a throwing septic emboli or progress into a forming an IJV uh, thrombosis or a Lemieux syndrome type of a picture, or it can spread retro, in a, at a retrograde fashion uh, to, 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 to the uh, intracranial uh, uh, Venous uh, sinuses. So, if we look at uh, the etiology of lateral uh, sinus thrombosis, uh, basically it can either uh, result from either acute uh, quiescent mastoiditis. This we usually see in, uh, in the in the pediatric population, or it can uh, arise from a mast uh, mast mastoiditis, or from uh, chronic otitis media, be it an uh, active mucosa disease or active squamous uh, disease. So you find that the etiology has actually changed um, in, the, in the past years uh, from an acute uh, sort of picture because of uh, uh, widespread use of antibiotics to a more sort of like, it, it, it's, it's, it's now more secondary to uh, chronic uh, 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 infections. And then if you look at the clinical presentation, uh, the clinical presentation varies according to the stage of the disease, um, uh, whether the patient presents with concurrent complications and whether the uh, patient uh, received any treatment prior to, to admission. But basically, it's a spectrum of, 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 of you know, there's a spectrum of clinical presentation from uh, being asymptomatic, uh, that is uh, being detected only through imaging, or uh, they may present with life-threatening septicemia. 
Uh, the classic symptoms are basically like in the pre-antibiotic era, the more specific or classic symptoms of lateral sinus thrombosis were severe headache uh, with otalgia, uh, with a picket fence uh, fever uh, due to uh, intermittent throwing of, of, of <coughs> emboli, of septic emboli from, from strep, uh, streptococcal sepsis. Uh, with the papillary edema. So the, those were the four classic or uh, specific uh, symptoms and signs of lateral sinus thrombosis. But this, of course, has changed uh, 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 due to the widespread use of antibiotics. As many times we see these patients, they come in after either in a, a suboptimal treatment with antibiotics or even being commenced with antibiotics uh, from the base hospital. Uh, in addition to those symptoms, they may also present with nausea and vomiting uh, and neck pain as was seen in our second uh, in our second case. And then if you look at other signs uh, that you can elicit is uh, what you call like the single sign uh, that is uh, thought to be pathognomonic for lateral sinus thrombosis. Uh, that is uh, uh, thought to be due to thrombosis of the mastoid and misery vein. And if patients present, present, uh, present with edema and tenderness over the posterior part of the of, of the mass uh, There is also an entity called the Kroibeck test uh, that is uh, by instituting pressure, instilling pressure on the IJV of the, of the health site. You then cause engorgement of the retinal vessels. This is seen uh, on the, on the phyndoscopy and the supraorbital veins. And then the engorgement then subsides on, on the release of, of the pressure. You are basically increasing your intracranial venous, uh, uh, venous, venous pressure. And uh, one other uh, test that you can do is a tope eye test. Uh, that is, uh, you're basically using a manometer to measure your CSF, uh, your CSF pressure. Uh, so uh, you basically, you compress, if, if you compress the IJV uh, on one side and uh, the contralateral IJV is patent, you don't expect your, 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 uh, your CSF pressure to, to rise. But if there is the occlusion or thrombosis of the of, 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 of your contralateral, contralateral IGV, then your CSF pressure will, will, will rise on, 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 on manometry. So basically that's the, the principles of the trope AI test. And then again, if once infection is spread uh, uh, distally along the, the IGV, then the patient may present with neck pain, especially with, with rotation. And you may feel a tender, a tenderness in a mass along the region of the internal jugular vein. And uh, if there is uh, the pressure on the, the jugular foramen due to, to the thrombus, you may, the patient may present with the jugular foramen uh, syndrome with the fallouts of cranial nerve and uh, number 9, 10, and, and 11. And then if we look at the bacteriology of the lateral sinus thrombosis, um, over the past years, the antibiotics have changed the bacteriology of lateral sinus thrombosis. Uh, mostly chronic rather than acute infection now precedes uh, lateral sinus thrombosis, and uh, mostly cultures yield mixed flora, uh, that is your bacteria with uh, staphylococcus, uh, enterobacteria, uh, pseudomonas, and proteus, etc. And then uh, imaging uh, basically serves as a diagnostic aid, and the definitive uh, diagnosis is, is, is usually made at, at, um, at surgery. And then if you look at, uh, at imaging, uh, you a CT scan, the gold standard is an MRI venogram, but uh, I'm sure in, in most instances, not an MRI is, 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 is a tower test. Disposer, so you can actually uh, pick up the diagnosis using a, with a construct basic contrasted uh, CT scan, uh, where you can use the CT scan to one one to assess the primary pathology, two to also uh, assess for other intracranial complications like intracranial abscesses or empyemas, uh, or, or you can see signs of or leptomeningeal enhancement in case of meningitis, and you can uh, as well see the classic delta sign. That is the triangular feeling defect in the sigmoid sinus with the surrounding a, 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 a hyperdense um, dura meter in, uh, in, in some cases, which is sort of like a classic sign of a thrombosis of a, of a sinus. And then an MRI scan is more sensitive. Uh, the gold standard is an MRI venogram, 
uh, it is it, it is uh, investigation of choice and you may as well see a delta sign or in an, in an MRI that uh, you know, feeling defect with this uh, I think tense uh, surrounding dura. The other advantage is that you uh, with an MRI also you can also assess for uh, other intracranial complications like cerebritis and you can like cerebritis or, or meningitis or, or, or cerebral abscesses and you can also uh, assess for, for venous uh, uh, flow uh, with an MRI. And then the other investigations that you can perform, uh, a lumbar puncture, uh, usually in patients with, patients with lateral sinus thrombosis, in up to 75% of cases, they have elevated uh, CSF pressures of up to 45 to 50 centimeters of water. And uh, of note is that uh, CSF analysis is essentially normal in about two thirds of cases. The, the other investigation that you can do is a few blood pump with differentials. Uh, we urea and electrolytes, uh, blood cultures, uh, as well as obtain uh, audio plans for hearing assessment. Then, if we look at uh, management, the main stand of treatment of uh, lateral sinus thrombosis is antibiotics and surgery. However, in uh, uh, selected cases, medical management uh, with broad spectrum antibiotics alone has been shown to, to, to surface. Um, this is sort of like in support of, 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 of that hypothesis. Uh, I looked at this uh, retrospective case series where they basically looked, reviewed five patients that were, 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 were managed with confirmed lateral sinus thrombosis. Uh, and in their results, the three patients that were successfully treated with IV antibiotics uh, plus uh, tympanostomy tubes with complete resolution of the sinus thrombosis. Uh, one patient had a mastodectomy with uh, uh, no pulse or granulation tissue found, which was deemed an unnecessary mastodectomy. And uh, one patient uh, had mastodectomy after failed antibiotics and tympanostomy tube insertion. Uh, these were of notice that these were uh, pediatric uh, patients. And in conclusion, uh, they concluded that IV antibiotics uh, plus tympanostomy tube insertion are uh, sufficient uh, for selected uh, cases of lateral sinus thrombosis. Of course, taking into consideration the, your clinical presentation, be it your patient present with uh, 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 complications or, or not. And then if we look at uh, surgery, different uh, surgical approaches have been sort of like uh, described. It's still an, an area of controversy in terms of addressing the thrombosed sinus main. But historically, mastectomy with incision of the sinus and removal of clot and packing with considered the standard of care. And uh, a removal of all perisinus infection is necessary for effective uh, treatment, even with lesser radical procedures. And again, uh, recently, lesser radical procedures uh, are, being, are being considered. So you find that um, most patients, actually all patients will require a mastectomy. Uh, patients with active mucosal disease may suffer with a critical mastectomy. And the sinus, it is, you should just take note that the sinus plate should always be removed. Uh, because uh, perisinus disease uh, may be present despite human appearing. A, a sinus plate. And then uh, for the you know, active squamous disease, a uh, canal or dermal mastectomy, which will reduce the further risk of further uh, complications and provide definitive uh, treatment for, for, for the patient. And then in addition to this is how we address uh, the, uh, the thrombosed the thrombose sinus. This is still an area of, of controversy, either to be aggressive in size, evacuate the throat and take the sinus or to employ a more conservative uh, sort of uh, approaches. So uh, I looked at this uh, 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 review. This, is, uh, this was a retrospective review of 11 patients. Uh, it's one of landmark, the landmark uh, papers if we're looking at a, 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 a sigmoid lateral sinus thrombosis. So they reviewed 11 patients from 92 to 2002. Uh, then an all had chronic otitis media with lateral sinus thrombosis, and seven of those had thrombus uh, uh, removal, and about four had needle aspiration. And the outcome, uh, uh, there was no difference basically in outcomes in the thrombus removal versus 
need to aspiration uh, group without further intervention. And they concluded, concluded that a conservative surgical intervention, including eradication of all perisinus infection and need to aspiration of the sinus uh, seems to be effective. There, uh, I couldn't get, find any systematic uh, reviews or randomized controlled trials comparing uh, the more aggressive and the more conservative um, approaches. But however, recent reports um, uh, say the removal of granulation tissue and inflammation, uh, that is uh, during the master uh, uh actually leads to a recanalization of the sinus even without a fluid evacuation. And during a child or uh, in, in an article in 2006, um, uh, proposed that a, an organized thrombus, which the initial step for spontaneous resolution, uh, which, which finally induces the canalization of, uh, of the sinus. And um, again, Akaran et al. In, uh, so most of, of this literature were mainly uh, case, case reports. Um, so Akaran et al. in, 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 in 2003 also described a case report of a six-year-old where they tried to, to, to monitor the natural history of, uh, of, 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 of conservative of a more or less aggressive approach to a lateral sinus thrombosis. Uh, and they noted that actually with the master tectomy and antibiotics for sepsis, there was a complete recanalization of the lateral sinus in this patient uh, without a need for uh, any such sinus surgical drainage or, or anticoagulants. And uh, again, in support of this seeing a tal in a case report uh, in 2016, reported two cases, uh, these were pediatric uh, uh, cases, who also have mastered to me uh, uh, with no sinus exploration uh, and also an excellent uh, recovery, sort of uh, supporting the, the, the effect that uh, may be conservative, uh, more conservative um, management in terms of uh, the, the sinus thrombosis are uh, actually effective. And then the other entity is uh, IG, IG, internal jugular vein ligation. This is also still uh, controversial. It uh, was performed routinely, routinely in the pre uh, antibiotic era, but not um, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the modern era where there's widespread use of antibiotics. And however, it is now reserved for cases where septicemia and emboli do not respond to initial surgery and and, and antibiotics. And if we look at uh, anti, anti, anticoagulants, uh, the role remains controversial. Uh, the potential benefits of anticoagulants are one, they may potentially limit the uh, thrombus pro propagation and they may improve uh, sinus recanalization and reduce a uh, neurological sequel. Uh, however, the risk of uh, hemorrhage uh, remains, especially in, in, in patients who Will need subsequent or will need a staged a surgical, a surgical intervention. And again, if you take note that it is also uh, instituting anticoagulants can cause the patients to, to risk of a venous, venous uh, infarct. <clears throat> so I also looked uh, at this, this as an article where they reviewed the literature of uh, anticoagulant uh, use if it's, it's, it's basically, is it's it if it was beneficial in, in cases of acute mastoiditis with uh, complicated by uh, lateral sinus, sinus thrombosis. Uh, however, they concluded that there is still lack of evidence to guide decision making. And uh, however, larger studies in uh, cerebral venous thrombosis have supported the use and demonstrated lower mortality rates in, 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 in those patients. And the uh, equestrian review also in, in, in 2011 um, uh, showed that there may be a slight uh, uh, lesser risk of, of death in, 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 in patients who are anticoagulated, but uh, it was, uh, however, the results were of, of no statistical uh, significance. And um, there's also uh, no evidence to support use of direct oral anticoagulants or between thrombophilia testing, though they've, uh, in this literature, they've noted that most patients up to 40% of uh, either of congenital acquired thrombophilias. But however, the uh, general indications for anticoagulants would be a septic uh, pulmonary emboli uh, 
if there's propagation of thrombus or multiple intracranial complications and uh, in patients with a docu documented uh, hypoperfect uh, state. <coughs> However, in the, the 2017 European Stroke uh, Organization guidelines, uh, they recommended that a therapeutic dose of heparin should be used in all patients with acute uh, cerebral venous thrombosis, even in the presence of intracerebral hemorrhage, and uh, a, a low molecular weight heparin over unfractionated heparin uh, should be used, except in patients who are allergic to low molecular weight heparin, or if a fast and perfect effect of is required uh, in case of, in, of patients that uh, need staged uh, surgical procedures. And then post-operatively, uh, uh, the general consensus is that patients should be uh, should receive IV antibiotics for about 10 to 21 days uh, with repeat imaging uh, to, to assess for any secondary intracranial complications or any propagation of, of the thrombus. And then in, in summary, although less frequent uh, complications of hepatitis media are still okay, and it is uh, quite important uh, that we recognize them early and institute broad spectrum antibiotics and proper uh, uh, surgical management. And uh, lateral sinus thrombosis, though less frequently seen, uh, it is still important to perform a mastectomy for source control. And however, addressing the thrombosed uh, sinus is still a controversial uh, a issue with less aggressive uh, measures uh, being seen to be a, a more, more, more effective. And anticoagulation is not routinely indicated uh, in lateral sinus thrombosis unless there is a, a, a thrombus uh, progression. That was my last um, slide, and those were my preferences. Thanks, Charles. That was a, a very nice presentation. Um, so we we frequently see sigmoid sinus thrombosis, and I must say it's you know we see it well you know we, we see it frequently enough as as part of complicated mastoiditis. I never get nervous about sigmoid sinus thrombosis because it's a thrombosis sigmoid sinus the surrounding inflammation, and, and for me that's sort of fairly clear cut. You know, they need antibiotics and, and usually we do a cortical mastodectomy. Um, the lateral sinus thrombosis, however, I always get nervous about. Uh, fortunately, it's very rare. I've seen three cases, none of them have survived. So for me, when a lateral sinus is thrombosis, that signifies propagation of a clot from the sigmoid. And those patients are sick. A spike in temps. And so, if a patient has an associated sigmoid sinus thrombosis with mastoiditis, we manage with IV augmenting. The minute it goes onto the lateral sinus, those that I manage is an intracranial complication with IV kept triaxone. I get the neurosurgeons involved. And usually, they I have not seen one patient survive that's got a very high mortality. Well, when I say that, I've seen three cases, and none of those three patients survive in spite of maximal uh, uh, um, medical treatment and surgery. So I get very nervous when I see a patient with lateral sinus thrombosis. And I have to say, my management approach is very much swayed by my experience of those three cases. Uh, I would always ask the neurosurgeons here, what do you, how do you feel about anticoagulation? They need to be managed in IV kept track. So for the full period of like the way you could manage meningitis, and um, if there's any indication, I remember one patient developed lemurs uh, and eventually died, and the other patient went on to develop a cavernous sinus thrombosis. So they're not well patients, they're sick. And when you look at them, they're sick. So this is not just a sigmoid sinus thrombosis, right? This is a patient who's, who's on maximal therapy and, and has, you know, has ongoing intracranial sepsis. And so, yeah, I, I, I realized the literature is very controversial. After, the, after my this patient died, I went up and looked at the literature. Um, but I must say, I am swayed by my experience of those three cases. So I'm very aggressive when it comes to, I would never open up a sigmoid sinus unless there was a period. So not open up the sinus. I don't needle either 
what I do is I usually do a cortical and then I will look surrounding bone or the posterior cerebellar plate. And if there's a very sinus abscess, I leave that away. And that's about as much as I do. But I don't open up sigmoid. And I certainly don't needle the sigmoid sinus. That doesn't make any difference at all because we've got very good imaging. And um, so I think if you, if you, you know, if you suspect a sigmoid sinus thrombosis, well, we, we don't have a problem with suspecting it because we've got such good imaging. But I think for patients, for uh, people who don't have CT scans frequently available, I think if you just expose the sinus, no needle it or don't open it, that should be enough. Um, rather than, you know, needling and, and opening up and um, if, there's, if there's surrounding the abscess, like a perisinus abscess, that definitely needs to be drained to manage uh, the infection. Thank you, Kathleen. Mm -hmm. Can you just describe the difference between the sequence and the actual science? If they might have confusing terminology. Well, I, Charles, you don't have a you don't have the uh, anatomy. You don't have a picture of the anatomy with the section key. I only have this venous um I'm sure it's venous. So if, if you're talking natural sinus of the brain, that is that is the same as the transverse sinus, that was my understanding. Whereas sigmoid sinus is obviously, as you know, the sigmoid sinus. But the lateral sinus and transverse sinus is synonymous. Can you just show us that pic? Yes, so you can just show the transverse sinus, shows you the transverse sinus. And you've got it, yes. So that would be lateral sinus. Transverse and lateral sinus are synonymous and sigmoid is obviously. So if infection, you know, this clot of the sigmoid sinus, we, we see every now and then we see it, you know, and, and it doesn't particularly, because the patient presented mastoiditis, but once it goes on to this sinus here, that's very dangerous. They've got such a high mortality. Um, and I'm not saying you should necessarily anticoagulate every case. But if you've got a patient, put them on keftriaxone, do the cortical mastoidectomy, and if they're not responding, if they've got this picket fence, you know, ongoing sepsis, then I think you have to get the neurosurgeons involved and say, look, how do you feel about anticoagulation here? Because, and you, one has to keep a very close eye on them because they also they develop raised intracranial pressure, Sort of otitikaidal kephalus and all of that, they can go on to develop having a sinus thrombosis or it could move down. So these patients are sick patients and you really have to keep a very close eye on them. You know, they don't behave like your like your normal sigmoid sinus thrombosis with a complicated mastoiditis. Thank you. 